Welcome to um, unit two, guys. We're off to a new unit. This is lesson one. We're going to talk about the development of the atomic theory, what stuff is made of. And um, let's dig into it. You can open up your note packets. And you'll see we have our vocab, like usual, um, all about the atoms and really crucial, actually, pieces right here. And then we'll be doing the first objective, which is understand how the modern model of the atom has evolved over a long period of time with the work of many scientists. Let's dig in here and um, let me just delete that part. All right. The idea of an atom starts off with one. It is a, you know what, I already have it here. One, it's the basic building block of matter. Two, cannot be broken down. And three, it's a single unit of an, an element, a single unit of an element. That's real weird. That's just floating out here. All right. Let's get into, um, so that goes right in here as our definition. I just can't seem to move that text down here. Let me try. All right. So that's a little better. Now, Dalton is the first one. I have a little video clip of Dalton, but I'll, I'll show it to you in a second. But his theory is not too complex. But he, you, we need to talk about him first because he's known as the founder of atomic theory. So he's the one who got the ball rolling since the ancient Greeks. The Greeks came up with some great theories, Democritus in particular, but um, Dalton took it to the next level. Basically, all matter is composed of indivisible parts. That means they can't be separated, called atoms. All atoms are a given element, are identical in mass and properties, so he thought they were all the same mass. Some of these theories turned out to be wrong. Some turned out to be true today. So I'm still true today. Compounds are formed with two or more atoms. Atoms cannot be created, destroyed, or converted into other atoms during chemical reactions. He and we look at these like indestructible spheres as like cannonballs. So it's called the cannonball theory. Like these atoms are just so small and dense and indestructible. It's not a bad idea to remember this idea as the cannonball theory. Do you have to know this for the regents? In fact, yes. You have to know that Dalton thought of it as a spherical model. So it is just like a basketball, but like really dense. And um, the whole thing is a uniform density. And you'll see how the theories turned out to be wrong and right. Um, and, and they were done through scientific experience. Now, this is a really interesting because this guy, J.J. Thompson, so look, it's not too long. It's just 100 years or so between the two. But then after this, you'll start seeing a whole bunch of um, changes very quickly. Anyway, J.J. Thompson used a cathode ray tube. And oh my goodness, these are the most cool things ever. They're like electron guns. Let me show you how the theory went from Dalton to J.J. Thompson in a little video. And um, I'll do the whole video in class, but just a clip to understand it. Propose that idea, but some aspects of that model remain uncontested to this day. Until the late 19th century, atoms were envisioned as indivisible particles, but that belief was shaken by an English physicist named J.J. Thompson and his trusty cathode ray tube. Inside a nearly vacuum glass tube, a visible beam of particles or cathode rays was generated by applying high voltage across metal electrodes. The stream of particles produced from the metal deflected away from the negative charge and directed towards the positive charge. After repeating this experiment several times with other metals, he came up with the first atomic model, the famous plum pudding model. This model characterizes an atom as a particle that is composed of a positively charged mass the pudding, as well as tiny negative charges embedded in it, like plums. After some initial resistance, this model became quite popular in the scientific world. Even so, New Zealand-born Ernest... We'll talk about Rutherford in just one second. Let's focus and dig into J.J. Thompson's discovery. So we made this cathode ray tube. It's remarkable. Um, shooting electrons through two different magnets.
and he could tell um, and separate. He's done a lot of things, but he can separate. If it bends, you know, for example, particles that bend are negatively charged and particles that go this way are positively charged. Um, so we'll talk about it a little bit more. The cathode ray tube deflected um, by the negative electrode. And so it went, oh, oh, I should just do the one that was the actual initial results. So it was, it was deflected by the negative. So we're talking about this one up here. And then the, um, it was towards the positive force. Sorry, little brain towards positive cathode. It was just discovered something very cool that there's something smaller than the atom. And he called those subatomic particles, which you might have heard of before. And the particle that was attracted to the positive and deflected away from the negative end as a, as a negative charge, and he called that particle an electron which I'll show you a beam of electrons in class. Um, he reckoned that they were very small, even on an atomic scale, and that turned out to be true. And he turned out, he hypothesized they were negatively charged. And that turned out to be true all the way until now. Now, having these, atom, not be one consistent sphere like a bowling ball, but having negative parts to it and positive parts to it, floating in the plum pudding, so to speak, we call this a plum pudding. Now, it made more sense 100 years ago because people like plum pudding. I have yet to see that at any restaurant or anywhere, but um, I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, we have um, positive pudding. I think I showed that in the red. And we have negative electrons embedded. That's my symbol for negative electrons and that's my symbol for electrons. Like raisin bread. That's something we do eat now. You can ignore JJ the walker. Um, Let's go on to Rutherford's experiment. You can see he has a radioactive substance inside of a lead block. It's like a gun, again, it shoots off particles. In this case, alpha particles, we call them. And that's how the Greeks made their letter alpha. And um, let me just pause for a second. All right, okay, sorry for the interruption. Uh, Rutherford did this great experiment. I was talking about uh, block with radiation in the middle, shooting out alpha particles. He put a really thin piece of gold foil. And you'd think gold foil would block everything, especially like light or rays that act like light. Well, it did and it didn't. And let's watch his experiment on the video. Let me just open that up for you. All right. Mr. Rutherford was not convinced. It was the early 1900s, radioactivity was all the rage, and during his work on radioactive decay, Rutherford discovered alpha, beta, and gamma rays. He wanted to develop a method to detect alpha particles and use it to probe into the structure of an atom. He did what every physicist at the time did. He came up with an experiment. The gold foil experiment, also known as Geiger-Marsden experiments, consisted of a thin sheet of gold foil, with a circular zinc sulfide coated screen behind it. The screen would flash every time an alpha particle hit it. Rutherford expected the particles to bullet through the foil and hit the screen behind it. And while most of the particles did behave as expected, some were deflected at an angle greater than 90 degrees. Backed by his observations, he came up with a new atomic model that disproved the previous one. All right. So that's Rutherford's experiment. Um, 
was conducted. And this is the things you have to know. There was a gold foil. I hope I explained in the video, I did a good job explaining why. Uh, very thin, and he bombarded it with particles, particles that he discovered. And so it's a thin piece of, um, like I said, foil. With a positive, and this is a symbol, of course, I use for positive, stream of alpha particles, which I use the symbol, the Greek symbol for alpha particle. Expected all the alpha particles to go through, but as you saw, most passed through, but some didn't. What conclusions did he get down to? Well, he created the nuclear theory. And if you guys know history, this is interesting because just prior to World War I, they're developing these theories. But by World War II, they'll develop into practical application with both nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Um, it's generally um, known that theories convert to things, but boy, that 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 really changed the effect of the or the uh, outcome of the whole war. What I want you to know is um, the, the components of the nuclear theory. The first thing is that the atom now is known to be mostly empty space. At the center of the atom is some sort of dense positive core. And we call that, and he had to come up with the name, that, that is called the nucleus, just like the center of a cell. And it provided no information about electrons. We know they existed other than the fact that they were located outside the nucleus. All right, let's take a look at our next contributor. He proposed an atomic structure where most of the atom's mass was concentrated in a positively charged center, which he later named the nucleus, around which the electrons orbited like planets around the sun. A year after the publication of Rutherford's atomic theory, Niels Bohr found a discrepancy in the model. If electrons were orbiting around a positively charged center, at some point those electrons would lose their energy and collapse into the nucleus, thus making the atoms unstable. However, that wasn't the case as atoms were generally quite stable, aside from the radioactive ones. This is where quantum physics comes into the picture. He used the concept of quantized energy to propose that electrons moved around the nucleus in fixed orbits or shells. A shell closer to the nucleus has lower energy, while the one farthest away has the highest energy. If an electron jumps to a lower energy orbit, it would give out the extra energy in the form of radiation, thereby maintaining atomic stability. Even though Bohr's model doesn't hold true for complex, multi-electron systems, this model is still the most popular representation of atomic structure in most textbooks. Excellent. All right. And that introduces us to Niels Bohr, who, if you doubt his intelligence and contribution, he tutored Einstein. So um, when Einstein had problems, Niels Bohr was who he turned to. Each of these guys helped the other guy move forward. It's generally called the Bohr model. And um, I don't like this name, but because it does help people remember it, it's called the planetary model. It has nothing to do with planets. It just sort of looks like the planets orbiting the sun. Electrons travel around. The nucleus, Bohr said, unlike Rutherford, who said, oh, yeah, they just travel around in a single thing, uh, single orbit, nucleus is well-defined paths. And that was true, but he added levels of orbits. So electrons in different orbitals have different energies. So they possess different amounts of energy.
it's as if um, your bedroom was on the lower floor and your um, gym was on an upper floor and you work out in the gym, but when you expend all that energy, you go back down to a lower level and a lower level contains less energy. Um, we talked about they have different amounts of energy. Um, electrons are absorbing or also known as gaining. energy, when they do that, it causes electrons to jump to the higher energy level. And that higher energy level is called an excited state. So there's times, oops, sorry, let me just. So it's an it's a excited state. What I meant to do is I just wanted to draw an element or an electron in a lower level jumping up here once some energy is added to the system. Okay, it goes to an excited state. Um, when it's an excited, when excited electrons, so that's okay, I think. When excited electrons go to a high energy level. Oh, sorry. When excited electrons, they emit a certain amount of energy. And they causes the and a certain amount of energy and causes electrons to fall back down to a lower energy level. And that lower energy level, let's say over here, is called the ground state. ground state. All right, that's Niels Bohr's contribution. The final model, we don't have one person who helped with it, though Einstein and um, Schrodinger was the biggest contrib contributors. It's the idea that electrons have distinct amounts of energy and they're called orbitals. And so that's still true. And orbitals in area, where there's a high probability. Instead of in the past where we would say there's certainty, we now say there's just a high probability of finding it. The reason is because Heisenberg proposed that there was no possibility of knowing where the position of a subatomic particle was. And um, knowing where it was and, and um, knowing its path or finding an um, electron. So you just can't find those electrons. You can say where there's probability of them being, but not for sure. So develop after the famous discovery that energy can be held. Oh yeah, this is really fascinating. Energy behaves both as a wave, and you can see like a light wave going through the universe. And But you can also know that from outer space and from all around, there's there's particles that hit us too. And hopefully in class, I'll be able to show you some particles um, as they travel through space. So many scientists, and that's the key part of this, is that many scientists use the scientific method to contribute to the theory. And one of the things for this wave mechanical model was called X-ray diffraction. And X-rays are super high energy form or wave of energy that you can use to interpret um, what's happening with the inside of an atom. All right, let's look at our multiple choice questions and talk about it and make sure you got the idea. Which of the following did Rutherford's gold foil experiment prove? Take a second to read through your answers, circle your answers, pause the video, and then unpause when you're ready. The answer to this question is that the atom is mostly empty space with a dense positive core. So remember, he set up the gold foil experiment. And the fact that some atoms bounce back from the gold foil, some most of them went through. But because one bounced back, the only way you could get a bowling ball thrown through a wall to bounce back is if it was 
down something harder than the bowling ball itself. All right, so go ahead and try these. I'll go over these the rest in class uh, or pause the video, go ahead and try these. I will give you, I will give you a second and then I'll get, then unpause and I'll give you the answers. J.G. Thompson's, thank you. Here's the answers. J.G. Thompson's cathode ray tube is negatively charged particles, electrons, and electrons. Um, and all of that is in the notes. I think that's it. But we got three more questions. Pause the video. You know the deal. Thank you for pausing. Here are the answers. Should be B. All atoms look like simple spheres, according to Dalton gain energy by jumping to an excited state, and they fall back to the ground state. All right, thanks for joining us.